Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to our stellar policy on flashpoints and security threats, Frank Gaffney and Peter Brooks. Good afternoon. Um, I won the Toyn cost, cost Toyn, Toyn cost, whatever it is. Um, I'm Frank Afney with the Center for Security Policy and delighted to be here with my friend and colleague Peter Brooks and with all of you. Uh, Jennifer, thank you very much for including me and most especially including this really important uh, topic in your program. Um, I'm heartened that you've made the point that a strong national defense is one of the pillars of this institute. and. Uh, I hope that you all are here because it is for you as well. Peter and I uh, sort of divided the labors in terms of explaining what the challenges are to our strong or not so strong as the case may be national defense posture at the moment. And I'm gonna talk with you principally about something that I'm reasonably sure just by virtue of uh, the sort of newsworthiness of it uh, is uppermost on your minds as well as mine, and that is the phenomenon of rising jihadism around the world, uh, notably but certainly not exclusively in Syria and Iraq under the banner of this organization that goes by varying names. It's been called um, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Sham, ISIS, or the Islamic State in the Levant, ISIL, which the president apparently prefers, or just plain Islamic State, which suggests they have in mind being in a lot of places. Or they also have fancied themselves as the caliphate. So I want to start, and I have a PowerPoint that I'm trusting will work here. Excellent, thank you. Um, entitled uh, with homage to um, uh, a, an honorary American citizen, Winston Churchill, uh, The Gathering Storm. That was the title, of course, of his first book in his uh, extraordinary series on World War II, the lead up to that horrific conflagration. Um, I guess I can power through this myself. Another Brit, Samuel Johnson, had this to say, and I think it applies equally to this. This is, of course, not an isolated incident. Uh, what happened to James Foley has been happening to thousands of people. At the hands of ISIS, yes, but at the hands of jihadists more generally. And I want to talk to you about what makes ISIS a particularly dangerous outfit, and then talk about their friends. I, I think you're probably all aware of these elements. Uh, they are actually folks who have, uh, not all, but many of them, been in the fight for some time, notably in Syria. Uh, they have acquired, uh, in no small measure, because uh, the Iraqi military that they confronted when they came across the border into Iraq in force, threw down their arms and walked away, a very substantial arsenal, including of a lot of our gear. Uh, they have a territory, and it's changing by the day, but uh, yesterday I heard it approximated to the state of Kentucky, the Syrian and Iraqi sides of the border. Uh, this is perhaps the most important of the pieces. They have very substantial resources, some of which they've liberated from banks, some of which they're getting from oil fields and the uh, electro uh, sale uh, from dams that they now control. Um, not least, as you hear more and more now, they are a threat to us because of Americans and others with EU passports, European Union passports, uh, operating with them, training with them, getting uh, battle skills of their own and presumably then coming home. Not least why these guys are particularly worrying is because in the words of Osama bin Laden, they are the strong horse now. And that is a very serious problem indeed. But I would argue that this is the biggest danger their ideology, or doctrine, or program, or agenda, call it what you will, that's what they call it, Sharia. 
And Sharia, as we will learn here, literally in Arabic means the path. Some say the path to the water. I want to emphasize this point right up front. There are probably hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world, including a great many in this country, who do not subscribe to Sharia. They don't practice it in their own faith tradition. They don't seek to live under it. They don't want to impose it on the rest of us. And I would argue, for the moment at least, they are not the problem. The problem is the guys who do. But let me just tell you a little bit more about what it is. By some estimates, roughly 10% of this body of laws and uh, dictates has to do with religious practice. You know, which direction you pray, how often, what you wash, what you don't, what you eat, what you don't, how you interact with others. But the problem is that about 90% has to do with that last bit of interacting with others in a very very aggressive fashion. Indeed, I think it's fair to say, by any objective standard, Sharia, the authoritative practice of Sharia under Islam is characterized by these qualities. It is comprehensive, it is totalitarian, and it is a comprehensive, specifically political, military, legal program that is meant to govern the entire world as well as the entire world of an individual. Uh, some of the characteristics of this are probably familiar to you. Uh, this fellow is getting off light. He's just being flogged rather than having things amputated. You see this a lot in Sharia adherent places. This young lady has had several things removed um, as part of the misogynism, the brutal mistreatment of women, but of course others are not just subject to amputation, um, they can be killed if they happen to be homosexuals or apostates or um, women who are claimed to have been unfaithful. Um, this is the one that I want to focus on, though. Uh, it is a supremacist doctrine. It is one that its adherents believe God has directed them to impose on all the rest of us, preferably through violence, because as Muhammad's example, he being the perfect Muslim, teaches that's the most efficient way to do it. But I'm going to come back to some of the other options. Um, I just want to emphasize this point. Unfortunately, though we are hearing a lot about ISIS or the Islamic State these days, they are hardly the only adherents to this Sharia doctrine who are on the march at the moment. Um, this is a sample, needless to say, not an in, inclusive list, but I just wanted to give you a sense both of the names of some of these other outfits that have exactly the same program as ISIS and are practicing it in exactly the same way as ISIS. You'll hear some people saying, oh no, Al-Qaeda thinks that ISIS is, is too ruthless and therefore has banished them. Not true. It's like mafia mob dons having a fight over who's going to control the racketeering. There's no difference between what Al-Qaeda can do and will do when it gets the chance, and that uh, behavior that we're now decrying on the part of ISIS. And lest we forget that all of these characters are operating, as you see here, increasingly globally, including in the United States. In a sudden focused preoccupation with ISIS, we compound the danger that ISIS certainly represents. Notwithstanding that, the president, in responding to the beheading of an American citizen, James Foley, earlier this week, made this statement, which I want to just stress to you, because it's simply outrageous. He said, and this is uh, excerpted, obviously, the Islamic State speaks for no religion. No faith teaches people to massacre innocents. And their, the Islamic State's, ideology is bankrupt. Now, ladies and gentlemen, with all due respect, that's national security fraud. None of those three statements is true. The Islamic State 
believes it is speaking for the faith tradition of Sharia adherent Islam, and as I've shown you, you can go to any of those other jihadist organizations, and for that matter, you can go to the authorities of Islam. At Al-Ansar University, for example, in Cairo, or in other major recognized institutions, including a number of them in this country, and you will see exactly the same basic doctrinal teachings. Indeed, you'll find them in the Quran itself, where, in fact, the slaughter of infidels is not only permissible, it is mandatory. Not throughout, to be sure, but in the operative passages, which are those that came at the end of Muhammad's life. Because Sharia is based upon one principle in particular called the principle of abrogation. And in accordance with it, what came last governs. And as you may know, the arc of Muhammad's life went from the period during which he was in Mecca and was receiving direction from Allah through revelations that were encouraging him to be peaceful and tolerant and respectful particularly of people of the book, Christians and Jews. It was at that point that he had no power and not much ability to do anything else. So you sort of saw a tactical approach that was accommodationist. But he was driven out and went to Medina and became rich and powerful and a leader of an army. And the revelations from Allah during that phase were all about destroying the people of the book, most especially the Jews and other infidels. And as to the question of whether this ideology is bankrupt, well, let me just share with you how these guys are doing. In addition to what I showed you in the previous slide of where they're operating now, including in a number of cases here. You could argue Al-Qaeda should be listed as here too. These are the sorts of things that our government has done to help a number of these jihadist groups. Running the gamut from enlisting them, engaging them in some sectarian struggles in places like Syria to arming and training them and fighting for them in places like Libya and embracing them right here in the United States in the case of the Muslim Brotherhood. And I want to just dwell on that for a moment, but before I do, let me just share with you this photograph because it came up in Lynn Cheney's remarks. The illegal release of five of these jihadist leaders. The guys on the lower band are their rough counterparts. These were not your run-of-the-mill jihadists. These are top combatants in what I call the war for the free world. Turning them loose even to Qatar, let alone more broadly, which is coming, uh, is, I, I believe, an enormous aid to the enemy. Then there's this. I think you probably picked up on this somewhere along the trail. James O'Keefe, um, character to be sure, crossing the Rio Grande in an Obama, excuse me, Osama bin Laden, Freudian slip. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. Uh, Osama bin Laden get up. And the trouble is, as you know, the insecure border is enabling people who are the real deal to come across, not just children, not just uh, people seeking employment, but people seeking to take advantage of the opportunity to bring the jihad here. I just want to close with a little bit on these guys because this is another form of threat that we almost always miss as we focus on kind of, if you will, the shiny dangling object of these violent jihadists. They're the scary guys. They're the guys who are actually killing people. And there's no question they seek our destruction too. So it's understandable that we're riveted by that. But then there's these folks. Um, you can't make this out too well, but we do have on sale here, <laughs> afterwards, um, a copy of this book called Sharia, the Threat to America. It was put together by 19 of the best people that I know. Uh, Peter was not among them, but him aside. 
uh, on this issue of Sharia and what a danger it is. And the appendix to this book, which we've also published as a separate book, which you can get for free uh, at securefreedom.org, downloadable, um, is an explanatory memorandum, they called it. It was really the strategic plan of the Muslim Brotherhood in North America, dated 1991, providentially delivered into our hands and used to great effect in the largest terrorism financing trial in American history, the Holy Land Foundation trial. This document said, among other things, this as its mission statement, that the Muslim Brotherhood is engaged in a kind of civilization jihad or grand jihad in eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within by their hands, meaning yours, my friends, and the rest of us, as well as the believers, so that Western civilization is eliminated and God's religion is triumphant over all others, victorious over all others. So how does that work exactly? Remember I just said that Muhammad had a sort of tactical adjustment during the period when he wasn't powerful? Well, this is basically the same deal that when you're not strong enough to actually use violence decisively in a nation like ours, you use this civilization jihad. And these are examples of the kinds of civilization jihadist techniques that are operating all around us. If you start looking for them, you will find evidence of them. In academia, in the media, in our financial system, Sharia compliant finance, in our courts, and I'm gonna come back to that in a moment, not least in our government. And I hope maybe in Q&A we can talk a little bit about that because that's a very serious problem. Um, we address it at length in a course that is also available for free online at muslimbrotherhoodinamerica.com. The last part, 10 parts, video-based training, talks about what we can do about all of this, and I'll close with that. Three things in particular. Uh, Michelle Bachman, sadly, leaving Congress shortly, but a great leader on these issues, has just introduced legislation that would designate the Muslim Brotherhood what it is, a terrorist organization. Albeit at the moment in this country engaged in the civilization kind of jihad, let's call it what it is, sedition, subversion, it's nonetheless overseas and here engaged in this same jihadist enterprise as is ISIS. We need to designate them, and I hope you'll help get that legislation enacted. Here in Colorado and in a number of other states around the country, we could use your help as well. I mentioned the courts were another place where the civilization jihadists are trying to insinuate Sharia. We've done a study, we're just about to come up with an update of it, indicating that in dozens of states around the United States, you're seeing what you're seeing in Britain, for example, which is the effort to insinuate this foreign law that is profoundly anti-constitutional, by the way, most especially for women and children, into our court system. Just one quick example, in New Jersey, a couple of years back, a state judge was appealed to by a Moroccan-born American naturalized citizen woman seeking a protective order against her husband because he was systematically torturing and raping her. And the judge declined to give her that protective order because he could find no evidence of criminal intent. The man was simply following his rights under Sharia. Fortunately overturned on appeal, but this law, which basically prohibits any foreign law, not Sharia, it's not singled out, any foreign law from being used in the courts of the given states, is, if they violate America's constitutional rights, is now on the books in seven states and was in the GOP platform last year. We really think it ought to be in every state in the union. And finally, I don't have time to develop this at any length, but another book which is also available to you addresses a problem that is of surpassing concern to me, and I hope we might have a chance to talk a little bit about it when Peter's done. The single most effective way that the Islamists, and for that matter, other enemies of this country, could take us out 
is by exploiting a vulnerability that has become increasingly evident, namely, the lack of resiliency of our electric grid. The electric grid, which of course powers all of the other critical infrastructure of this country, without which none of it works, and without which none of us work, or probably live, for that matter. One estimate is that if the power goes out for over a year, nine out of 10 of us will die. And don't take my word for it, this book is a compilation of 11 different studies that have been done by the United States government. This is just their executive summaries, but it gives you the flavor of it. And whether they're looking at physical assaults on elements of the grid, which has been happening increasingly of late, or cyber attacks against the grid, or something that could be very efficient in taking it down, uh, detonating a nuclear weapon in space over the United States, unleashing something called electromagnetic pulse. Or, even if none of those terrible things happen, despite the fact there's a lot of evidence that enemies of this country have that in mind for us, even if none of those events take place, those man-caused events take place, you will find the sun creating very similar conditions to that nuclear detonation in space. Every 150 years, we get whacked with something called a Carrington class event of enormous electromagnetic energy as a result of a solar flare. And I'm sorry to tell you that the last time that happened was 155 years ago. The good news is, as the last points make clear, we know how to fix the vulnerabilities we have. We just need your help in getting that done before one or the other of these bad things eventuates. With this cheery introduction, I'm gonna turn over the rest of the program to Peter, who will give you some of the really bad news. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions. Good afternoon. That certainly was uh, frightening, Frank, but thank you very much for sharing that with us. I want to thank Jennifer for having me here again. I, I have to think that uh, my repeated appearances here is a vibrant example of the phrase, the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> but there are important things going on in the world, and I think we have to face them square on. So I'm going to talk about some of the other things and, and talk about some of the things that Frank talked about in a little bit greater greater depth in the short time we have here. I think it would be a, an understatement, if you're following the news, and I know you are, that um, the world is unsettled. Worse, the threats to U.S. interests and our security are growing. And one, indeed, one could reasonably argue that the world is more dangerous today than, than at any time in a, in a generation. If we are complacent about these threats, we could pay a very big price. Let me tell you about some of my major concerns. I'm going to talk a little bit more about ISIS. Everybody knows what that is, right? The Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, sometimes called ISIL, sometimes called the Islamic State, as Frank, as Frank pointed out. We're not dealing here with a terrorist group. We're dealing with a terrorist army. We're talking about 10 to 15,000 committed, violent, militant jihadists working together for a singular cause. In fact, I was just reading today that that number may be small, considering the successes they've had recently in Iraq. They're drawing more people in. There are, and thousands of these, 10 to 15,000 or more, are actually what are classified as foreign fighters, people from outside of Iraq or Syria. In fact, I've seen numbers, and it's very hard to figure this out, of that there are foreign fighters with ISIS from as many as 50 to 70 countries around the world. And if you look at the UN number of countries, it's roughly between 190 and 200 countries in the world today, or states. That's a significant number. In fact, you could say that there, with this ISIS group that's uh, involved in Iraq and Syria, that there are more terrorists in any one place at any one time than we've ever seen before. And that includes pre-9-11 Afghanistan. I mean, this is frightening stuff. As you know, they've taken a large swath of land that includes, as Frank mentioned, Iraq. 
and Syria. And they've established a Muslim state, a caliphate, led by a caliph. And they've left, if you're following the news, even before this tragic death of this American journalist, they've left a trail of death, destruction, and depravity in their wake. These guys are so bad that Al-Qaeda has disavowed them, if you can believe that. When you think about, this is the Al-Qaeda that flew planes in the buildings in New York City and in Washington, D.C. We're talking about almost 13 years ago. That's how bad this group is. And it has America in its crosshairs. The press has reported recently, and people have been talking about for quite some time, that ISIS has, been, uh, has training camps in Iraq and Syria, probably more Syria. Their headquarters, their capital is in Raqqa, is in Syria, northern Syria. And they have been establishing training camps, not only to teach the terrorist dark arts to those who will come and fight the Syrian regime or the Iraqi, the Iraqi government, but also to train foreign fighters to return to their native lands to undertake acts of terror at some point. And then, just recently, I think about a week ago, an unnamed U.S. intelligence official, I believe this article was in the Washington Post, at least the one I saw, there may have been some other as well, said that um, they believe ISIS is trying to establish cells in Europe to undertake terrorist attacks and potentially the United States. So if you hear what the U.S. government is saying publicly about this, you can imagine there's probably a lot of other stuff they're not talking about because of sensitive intelligence sources and methods. ISIS has said, I mean, uh, has said they plan to raise Al-Qaeda's flag over the White House. I think we have to take them at their word. It would be a mistake not to. Of course, Syria is part of this problem. In my opinion, Syria today is the epicenter of the violent Islamist jihadist movement in the world today. No question about it. Tens of thousands of committed individuals have gone there. It's a magnet for terrorist wannabes. The FBI says publicly that they're, they're tracking at least 100 Americans who have gone to Syria and perhaps Iraq to fight. There's already been at least one American suicide bomber in Syria. The Brits will tell you, because they're very concerned about this individual who undertook this uh, heinous act against the American journalists, maybe British, they talk about they're following at least 400 British citizens, citizens who have gone to Syria. And they can't really tell because people don't go to Syria and get their passports stamped and then return home. They go to Jordan, they go to Turkey, they go to other places, these circuitous routes. Uh, and then they enter Syria and then maybe even, even Iraq. Europe will say, this is obviously a round number, that there may be as many as 3,000 Europeans that have gone to Syria and Iraq to fight. And of course there are many others from across the globe, as I mentioned, 50 to 70 countries. But when you think about Europe, Think about the fact that many of those people have passports and may be able to come back to Europe and then travel to the United States after that. Of course, Syria has been involved in a terrible situation for many years now. Three plus years of civil war, 150,000 people have perished in the violence there. As I mentioned, the home of ISIS is there, as well as other hardened Al-Qaeda groups. There's another group that hasn't been disavowed by Al-Qaeda yet called Al-Nusra. And they were most recently infamous for the fact that they were do you remember this a couple of weeks ago they talked about if you were coming out of Europe, you were going to have to be able to turn on your cell phone or your computer before you were able to board a plane? Well, we forget about all the things, all the terrorist plots that never happened. It may surprise you to know that there have been as many as 60 terrorist plots against the United States since 9-11. Now, a few of those have been successful, you know, quote unquote. I mean, they're terrible things. But they, these terrorists have been able to bring these things to fruition. We had Fort Hood, right? We had the Boston bombers. We also had a couple of recruiters killed by Islamists in Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas. They had the, you know, one spark away from setting off a SUV in Times Square. But there have been 60. So much, but you forget about the things that don't happen. And the same thing with this. So people were told you're going to have to turn on your cell phone, you're going to have to turn on your computer, because what was going on is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which I believe Frank mentioned in his slide presentation here, was planning, or at least this is what we know outside the government, was planning to put explosives inside a cell phone or inside a computer to put it on an aircraft bound for the United States and blow it up. Now, I don't know that that threat has been lifted. I don't know if they're still checking that in Europe or not. But this is what we're, this is what we're dealing with. And this al-Nusra group, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, was dealing with 
al-Nusra in Syria. They were going to be the operatives. The master bomb maker for al-Qaeda today is in, with al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen, Ibrahim al-Asiri. I'll talk a little more about him, but I'll just I'll talk about him now. He's the underwear bomber guy. One plot, remember, over Detroit a couple of years ago? A second plot where we actually, from news reports, we had penetrated al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and walked off with the device before it could be used. This was the group that had the printer cartridges. This is the group and the bomber who has also been involved in the surgically implantation of explosives into human beings. In fact, I don't know if this is true, it may be apocryphal, but the story is that Asiri planted a bomb inside of his brother, sent him to Saudi Arabia to meet with a, the senior counterintelligence counterterrorism official, a, a Saudi prince, and um, was meant to kill him in a suicide bombing. His brother died in the bombing, and I believe two bodyguards, but the prince was not killed. So this has happened already. This is not something that people are thinking about, but this is what we're up against. Also Syria, people forget about the fact that Iran is Syria's best ally, the government in Damascus' best ally. Hezbollah, out of Lebanon, is also fighting there to protect the regime in Damascus. There's no send to end to this conflict, and it will continue to serve as a terrorist training ground, it seems, for some time to come. Some of these terrorists, at some point, may de decide not to stay in the caliphate that ISIS has, has established and return home. Who knows what they'll do then? Let me talk a little bit about Iran. As I mentioned, Iran is fighting in both Iraq and Syria. There are Iranian operatives today involved in the, in the fight. They're, they're nervous about what's going on with ISIS because it's a Sunni group. Remember, Iran is a Shia Persian country. Al Qaeda, ISIS is generally a Sunni Arab entity. Iran's rise will be severely curta curtailed by the loss of an ally in Damascus or a loss of an ally in Baghdad. This is, these two fights are must wins for them. Iran has grand ambitions in that part of the world and these two countries, as well as some others, are key to that. Unfortunately, Iran's nuclear program, which hasn't been in the news much lately, has been a little slowed. And it's my view that time is on Iran's side. Yeah, maybe the centrifuges aren't being used as much, but they've, they've compiled enough low enriched uranium to turn that into high enriched uranium in, in pretty short order, enough for several bombs. But while these negotiations are going on, Iran is also has time to work on its weaponization of this, of this, of this material. It also has time to, to perfect delivery vehicles. In fact, the US government publicly has not moved off the fact that they said a few years ago that Iran will have an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of reaching the United States by 2015. That's next year. They already can put a satellite into space. They've been working on this for a while, and in fact, they've probably been helping the, the North Koreans do that as well, because they followed Iran in that capability. And all of you are probably too young to remember, because you probably read it in e-books or something like that, Sputnik, 1957. And uh, when, the, when the Soviets put that little satellite into space, I mean, we were really, really unhappy about that. It was a public relations disaster for the West, for the United States, that the Soviets had bested us scientifically and technically. But in the bowels of the Pentagon, the Dr. Strangeloves there were really concerned because they knew that if you can put a satellite into space of a significant payload or a significant payload into space, into orbit, you could put a warhead anywhere on the Earth's surface. And the fact is the Soviets actually did beat us in the ICBM race. Same thing here. The Iranians started out with a peaceful satellite program and eventually they'll be able to, if they wish to, develop an intercontinental ballistic missile program. And the intelligence community has said that that may be as soon as, as next year. Let's talk about Afghanistan. Another, another thing we haven't been talking much about lately, but as you know, there are 30,000 Americans fighting there. I worry, what I really worry is that the movie we're seeing in Iraq is the movie we're gonna see in Afghanistan in the coming years. And I didn't talk a lot about Iraq, but it's not gone well 
since U.S. forces left at the end of 2011. And I worry about that's what we're going to see in Afghanistan. We're reducing our troops there. Uh, they're going to be totally gone. We may have an interim force. We're waiting for an Afghan government to get together, a new president to come on board. They've been having some political problems with vote counting and other things. Um, and we're looking for a bilateral security agreement, which we never achieved with Iraq. That's why U.S. forces left. All of them left at one time. If we don't get that, we won't have any forces there. If we do stay, the president is looking at about 10,000 troops. But he says they're all going to be gone by 2016, regardless of the conditions on the ground. Unfortunately, we think about as we draw down, the Afghan forces will stand up. We're drawing down. Afghan forces are standing up, but violence is also up. We're dealing with some really tough actors there. We're talking about not only Al-Qaeda, Al but the Taliban, the Afghan Taliban, and also the Haqqani Network, which is probably the most active and difficult insurgent slash terrorist group that we're dealing with in Afghanistan. My view is, is that Afghanistan could return to its pre-9-11 state. That is a place where terrorists, a safe haven where terrorists can plan, train, and operate. And I don't think that's good news for us. Equally troubling to me is that Afghanistan, if you think about the geography, could be used as a safe haven by the Pakistan Taliban. Remember, there's an Afghan Taliban. There's also a Pakistan Taliban to unsettle the Pakistani government in Islamabad. Remember, Pakistan, we haven't heard much about Pakistan uh, much lately either, but Pakistan is a country with a nuclear arsenal of more than 100 nuclear weapons. And we know that some of these groups, such as Al-Qaeda, would like to get their hands on those nuclear weapons. And there has been a lot of concern over the years about the security of the Pakistani nuclear arsenal. And I'm not in the circles where they're talking about these sort of things, but I know there has been a tremendous amount of concern. And the last thing we'd want to see is Al-Qaeda or anybody else, or Al-Qaeda affiliate, Al-Qaeda ally, get their hands on a nuclear weapon. In terrorism, Frank covered a lot of this sort of stuff. But I think that the Al-Qaeda or Al-Qaeda offshoot or a kind of affiliate, actually that threat is growing. I talked about Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Yemen. Up until ISIS really kind of gained prominence in the last few months, I would say Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula was the most dangerous group that we faced. And the government would have told you the same, same sort of thing. I mentioned some of their plots, the underwear plot, the printer cartridges, the fact that they have the best, the best bomb maker. Uh, very, very dangerous. We have Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, Mali. It's an, and of course, one of its offshoot, Ansar al-Sharia, was responsible, largely responsible, along with AQIM, for what happened in Benghazi on September 11, 2012. Boko Haram in Nigeria. You've heard about them and this terrible t kidnapping of these young schoolgirls. But they're also involved in a lot of terrorist acts there against the government. Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Another, another group that we're particularly worried about because the FBI will tell you that a number of Somali Americans have gone there to fight. And there's been a long standing concern about will they return to the United States and will we know that they've gone and will we be able to do something about it if we, if we need to. Worse, many of these groups are working together, especially the ones, especially the ones in Africa. Another concern is that each one of these groups will try to outdo the other in a drive to gather more foot soldiers, funds, and publicity. In other words, ISIS is the most high visibility terrorist group out there right now. So if you're gonna see funding go that way, you're gonna see foot soldiers go that way. These other groups who also have agendas will wanna steal some of that away from them. So there's gonna be some rivalry and they may try to do things that they wouldn't have tried before to bring that publicity in their direction. And the idea, another thought, the idea that these, their activities, these terrorist group activities, as some of the ones I mentioned, you know, they seem very, very far away, and people tend to say, ah, it's just a local thing, it's just a regional thing. That can change in a moment. That can go from just something in dealing with a, the country you're dealing with, the government you're dealing with, to becoming a transnational or international terrorist threat, including targeting the United States. Russia. Russia's kind of on the roll, isn't it? Took Crimea this year. Wasn't much of a response. It's supporting an insurgency in eastern Ukraine today. In fact, it sent its 
what they're calling aid trucks across the border into Ukraine. The Ukrainian government say it's basically an evasion invasion. There have been military trucks that have been painted gray. They're not being escorted, from what I understand in the news today, by the International Committee of the Red Cross. And who knows what's in those trucks because they've not been inspected. Russia also has as many as 40,000 troops, combat-ready troops, across the border from Ukraine. It could certainly go into eastern Ukraine any time it wanted to. It's a much more capable force than the Ukrainian army. Russia is also, I'm Frank would be the person to talk about this. He knows much more about it. Uh, the U.S. government has finally come out and said that they're violating the INF Treaty. The inter inter this is a Reagan-era treaty that you probably worked on uh, about uh, intermediate nuclear forces in Europe. And now we find out that Russia, we believe Russia is violating, is violating that treaty, that arms control treaty. Russia has also been threatening NATO allies in recent years. I mean, Russian President Vladimir Putin plans to restore Russia's Cold War era power and prowess, in my estimation, and it's something we need to be very concerned about. In Asia, North Korea, we have a new, young, enigmatic leader. He's consolidating power, lots of purges going on, lots of changes in the military, lots of changes in the Korean Workers' Party. He's not a reformer we thought he might be. He was educated in Switzerland, actually, but he's actually turning out to be quite hard line. And my concern is that he wants to really make his mark in the world. He doesn't, have the, he doesn't have the credentials that his grandfather, the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung had, who was somebody who was involved, obviously, in the Korean War, or his father, Kim Jong-il, who, uh, who had held the reins of power for many years under, under his father. This is his, the grandson, Kim Jong-un. So he just doesn't feel like he has the credentials, the chops, with the military, with the Korean Workers' Party, to perhaps hold that power. So he's been involved in a lot of purges. And the concern is, is that he might get involved in some sort of miscalculation, misperception, or mistake that could lead to some serious or dire consequences on the Korean Peninsula. Of course, he has an increasingly robust nuclear weapons program. He said there's, North Korea has had three nuclear tests. There was rumor of a fourth test this year, but for some reason it hasn't happened yet. In recent, uh, I guess, Last year, he was able to put a satellite into space, hearkening back to what I was talking about with Iran. We believe that North Korea actually has the capability to put an intercontinental ballistic somewhere on the west coast of the United States at this point. At some point in the future, it could become more accurate and have a longer range, and um, it'll be um, even a greater threat to us. Let me talk about China lastly. I'm getting the sig, I'm gonna get the hook here. There's so much to talk about. Beyond the United States, no country has the potential to shape this century more than China. Any of you that are keeping up on the news, and I know all of you are, you know that. China is increasingly powerful, whether you're talking about militarily, politically, or economically. In my opinion, China would like to replace the United States with preeminent power in the Pacific, if not globally. And I think it's taking steps to do that. It already is throwing, as you know, it's already throwing its weight around increasingly in territorial disputes in the East and South China Seas with U.S. allies, the Philippines, and Japan. And many China analysts believe that they're actually testing American resolve in the Pacific. Unfortunately, once again, misperceptions, mistakes, and miscalculations can lead to dire consequences. And I think as China's confidence and capabilities grow, the rivalry with the United States will only intensify. So the bottom line, we're living in an increasingly dangerous world where U.S. interests face growing threats. It's my view that a failure to proactively rise to these challenges with international leadership, diplomatic resolve, economic vitality, and military strength could mean some very dark days ahead. Fortunately, that choice is ours. Thank you very much. I think we're supposed to move this. Is that possible? Great. Thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes of time for questions. I'm afraid I went much longer than I meant to, so forgive me for that. And, and Peter I and I would be delighted <laughs> to uh, take whatever questions we do have time for. Uh, is there still a mic somewhere in the back? Anybody have a mic? Yep. Great. I'm 
not sure it's on. Can you hear me now? One of the things that surprised me since 9-11, and I thought we would be vulnerable to it, would be individual bombing attacks in lots of areas like we've seen in the Mid Mideast and we've seen it in Southeast Asia. How come we've avoided that here? Or is it a fact that it's a, a plan for later on on a much grander scale? Well, it's a great question. I, Peter may want to comment on it too. The, uh, the issue in part, as Peter said, is they've actually been trying to do attacks. Uh, fortunately, and in many cases, it's been good you know, work on the part of our uh, first lines of defense to prevent that from happening. And in some places, we've just been bloody lucky. I happen to think another thing is at work, though, and I, it goes back to that, that arc that I talked about uh, of Muhammad's life and of the model that the Muslim Brotherhood follows. I think that there is a very strong sense on the part of those in the Brotherhood's apparatuses in this country, and there are scores, if not hundreds of them, by the way. Indeed, almost every Muslim American organization that you hear about notably outfits like the Council on American Islamic Relations or CARE or the Islamic Society of North America are Muslim Brotherhood front organizations. And I think their view is don't engage in those acts of violence, it's premature. It'll just anger the Americans and make our job more difficult. So I think that's at work uh, with some, uh, but I, I suspect Peter would agree with me, we're on borrowed time frankly. The, the more we indulge this kind of behavior, let alone enable it, the more we leave the borders porous, uh, the more we signal weakness. The Sharia interpretation of that behavior is the time has come to go violent, to make them feel subdued, as the Quran says. I, I, yeah, I have a question for each of our speakers. Frank, this is a question in response to what you said about um, some of the inroads that the Mo Muslim Brotherhood is trying to uh, get into American culture, and you talked about <clears throat> interfaith um, conversations, and our clergy is, is increasingly reaching out. Is that something that should be resisted, and, and, and how can that message be, be uh, delivered to our clergy? And then the other question is for Peter. Um, one of the major groups that, that <clears throat> you um, omitted from your discussion was um, talking about uh, what's going on in, in Israel. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the big client of Iran, Hamas, it has, um, has distracted attention away from the Iranian nuclear program. And a lot of people who are interested in Israeli politics believe that that's, that was the, the goal of that. Is that something that you ascribe to as well? Can I start? Go first. Yeah. I think um, you make a very good point. I couldn't talk about everything. As, as you know, there's so, much, there's so much going on. Obviously, very disturbed by the fact that we have a, a friendly state in Israel fighting a terrorist group today, when you think about it. And this is something that we all could see down the road when we talk about ISIS, you know, terrorist groups taking on states. Um, clearly, I thought my, my interpretation of what Hamas did was, was, was in an act of desperation. Uh, they've been a complete failure in, in the Gaza Strip, and unfortunately, the Palestinian people are held hostage to their inability to govern and their policies. Um, so this is obviously something we, we need to be concerned about. Hamas actually has fallen out with the, the government in Damascus, the Syrian government, who has been a, a strong supporter of them because they're actually siding with the uh, violent Islamists in, in Syria. But Iran is obviously still very much concerned, and obviously Israel is worried about opening up the borders there because of what's going to come across those borders. Uh, even Egypt has done, has had closed the, uh, the, the crossings because of those concerns. So it's not my, I, I certainly can't speak for the government of Israel, uh, but my interpretation is, is that humanitarian uh, issues or materials are fine. It's the concern that weapons will come in. And as we've seen with these large number of rockets, over 2,500, I believe, the latest number I saw, fired into Israel, which the Iron Dome 
missile defense system, by the way, something we ought to be thinking about when I talk about ICBMs, worked tremendously. And those rockets, people forget, were fired indiscriminately at civilian targets. And it was only because of the capabilities of that system that the U.S. helped with as well uh, that Israel was able to stay protected and it was such a lopsided military engagement. So yeah, Hamas is a, is a major problem, uh, obviously, and a friend, of, a friend of Iran. My sense it was an act of desperation because of uh, uh, Hamas having lost the Muslim Brotherhood government in Egypt, uh, it, it did it as an act of desperation. But there are many different interpretations to that. If I leave you with one thought about um, Sharia, it would be that this really is about power, not about faith. The problem for the faith community in this country is they are being encouraged to believe it's the other way around or that power doesn't have anything to do with it. It's just about faith. And it's very seductive. Uh, you, you know that old uh, line about uh, in, in World War II when they came for the socialists, I did nothing and so on. They, when they came for me, there was nobody left. Uh, the faith community here, many of them, not all, but many of them have been encouraged to believe that unless they stand up for their Muslim counterparts, uh, there will be a repression of freedom of religion more broadly. Uh, and so you have, I think, innocently, many pastors, priests, rabbis, what have you, offering unbelievable opportunities for influence operations to imams who are, again, not all of them by any means, but mostly the ones who are working this particular line of the civilization jihad deeply imbued with the Sharia agenda. And interestingly enough, one of the first things that they do, and this happened, by the way, in the Vatican back in uh, June or July, one of the first things these imams typically do is they go into some prayer incantation in Arabic which consecrates the space they're in to Allah and sets in train a series of declamations you know, against the infidels. But the main thing is this, if, again, we find people of faith helping to provide what amounts to cover for these Islamists, it will be just one more successful inroad that they're making in keeping us witless about what they're up to and therefore much less capable of defending ourselves against them. Thank you for the question. Is this on? This is kind of a basic question. Oh. Okay. Um, if you were going to prepare for being off the grid, what books would you recommend? What websites would you recommend? Or what quick tips? Well, I'm, I'm for being prepared and for people being self-reliant and responsible. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm just here to tell you that unless you perhaps live out here and have access to fresh water and a means of growing some food, it's unlikely you're going to be able to persist very long without help coming from someplace else. And you know, think about this. Uh, if the kind of devastation that we saw with Katrina or with Hurricane Sandy had not been localized, I mean, they were over fairly wide areas, yes, but still it was fairly localized, and the rest of the country was intact and able to come to the help of the people who were afflicted, uh, not a lot more people wouldn't have made it. And that's my real concern about this. I, I, again, if I can leave you with one other thought on this, this grid issue. Please take a look at this book. It's, it's called Guilty Knowledge, What the U.S. Government Knows About the Vulnerability of the Electric Grid but refuses to fix. And if you take this set of warnings aboard, I think you will be moved to do the single most important thing that I could recommend. And that is 
get a hold of people who can do something about this vulnerability to fix it now, because we don't have to talk about what do we do to survive when it's too late. We have a chance, I think, to, uh, to make changes. And there, are, I mentioned some legislation that is working its way slowly through Congress. Um, your electric grid operators, many of you probably are investors in companies that uh, if they aren't actually electric utilities, they're big users of electricity. Maybe you're on boards of directors. Uh, maybe they're neighbors of yours are board of directors members. Think about ways in which you can help. There's a lot of information available at securethegrid.com that will give you more information and more backup for this. But the, the name of the game, the answer to your question, ma'am, really is let's stop this disaster from happening rather than try to cope with it after it does. Oh, just one point. This is a, a very serious threat. One of the things that uh, Frank wasn't able to get into is where the threat comes from. Um, both. There's a concern, obviously, about cyber terrorism. We have three electrical grids in the United States. There's only three. 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 We Sections. know that cyber terrorists have looked at this issue, but also nation states. Um, it's been widely reported that both Russia and China have mapped the U.S. electrical grid. So if there were ever a dust up over territory or a war, uh, these you could expect that they would try to shut out the lights in the United States. And you can imagine what a distraction that would be to the national command authority who may be involved in sending troops into battle when you know th there's planes in the sky and hospitals don't have don't have electricity et cetera et cetera so this is a very serious national security issue and there are because of the I wish we could have gotten into I didn't get into cyber just because of time huge threat whether it's warfare espionage or even the potential for cyber terrorism that could target the grid the financial system et cetera et cetera so I think we probably ought to stop there so you can stay on close to schedule. Thank you, Thank you very much.